I'll start a little bit early, if that's all right. Uh, so this is a work on the evolution of shared intentions. I can't tell you exactly what that is. With Simon Angus from Monash University. So parts of this I'm going to have to skim over, but you can always attack me anytime afterwards and get me to explain them. Um, actually quite difficult to present this whole thing in an hour or an hour and a half, so we, we shall see how it goes. I'll start off with this quote from John Searle. And John Searle's a philosopher, and he's written that the intuition is that collective intentional behavior is a primitive phenomenon that cannot be analyzed as just a summation of individual intentional behavior. And collective intentions expressed in the form, we intend to do such and such, cannot be analyzed in terms of individual intentions expressed in the form, I intend to do such and such. And this is quite easily understood if I explain this by way of a game. So this is a two-player game. There are two actions, A and B. So the players are me and you, and we only obtain a payoff if we do the same thing. If we both do A, we get a payoff of two each. If we both do B, we get a payoff of one each. If we miscoordinate, we get nothing. So consider these expressions understood in English, as you would usually understand them. Uh, so the first, first thing is, I intend to do B, and I think that you intend to do B. We call that I. The second expression is, we intend to do B. Now, these, these are different things. These statements are different things, in a way that they would be if I was simply stating what we would do. So I'm saying this is not just an accumulation of individual intentions. To think about this, think about these criticisms. Would it be right to criticize expression I by saying, this doesn't make sense, it's pretty so inefficient for us both to play B? No, that's not a good criticism. Why is it not a good criticism? Because if I truly think that you intend to do B, then it's individually optimal for me to also do B, regardless of whether B B is Pareto efficient or not. And you can think the same. However, a criticism of W, as in W doesn't make sense because B B is Pareto efficient. Now, this, this sounds intuitively plausible, right? To say, we intend to do B. Well, why would you intend to do B? You could intend to do A between the two of us, and we would get a higher payoff. So this is how we understand shared intentions. We understand it as entering into the optimization problem that people solve. So you, you could solve, if it's individual intentions, people are solving individual optimization problems. Where you share intentions, you're solving shared optimization problems. Now, philosophers actually disagree as to whether Collective intentions, so shared intentions, can be represented, always be represented as individual intentions plus, for example, beliefs and hierarchies of knowledge. We, we're going to ignore that. We're just going to look at, it can remain a black box, we're just going to look at the implications of this sharing of intentions, the implications of this different optimization problem being solved. And um, for any philosophers in the audience, if you say what we're going to do, and you may hate this, is ignore the representational elements of intentions, ignore what's actually going on in our head, and focus on just the causal element, as in the behavioral implications of the sharing of intentions. So, why is this important? Well, in the last, over the last decade, there's been a literature in developmental psychology, um, mainly by Michael Tomasello and many of his co-authors. And he has this, this big idea. And the big idea is that sharing of intentions and collaboration between humans has, it gave humans a niche in which the unique awesomeness and smartness of human cognition could evolve. So 
In short, the theory is that because we're collaborative, and it particularly has a lot of experiments comparing humans to other great apes, because humans are collaborative, that made us smart. So, one criticism of this hypothesis is potential circularity. So if you read the work of Thomas Sello and his co-authors, he will make reference, he makes reference to the philosophy literature on the sharing of intentions. And one author he mentions is Bratman. Now, Bratman, unlike Searle actually, Br Bratman, in his discussion of shared intentions, actually refers, uses the concept of common knowledge. Now, the idea that I know something, and I know that you know, that I know that you know, that I know something, and all of those ad infinitum. Now this is actually um, quite, quite complex, cognition-wise, to have hierarchies of knowledge and hierarchies of beliefs. In fact, you might argue that it is actually infinite, it's computationally impossible for us to have it. So, in a sense, if you're going to use that in explaining collaboration, you're saying that to collaborate, you need to be smart. But we've already said that the very idea is that you're smart, humans became smart because they were uniquely collaborative. So we need a way of explaining collaboration that doesn't require you to be smart in the first place, otherwise you've got circularity in your argument. And that's what we do. We Got, um, we take pretty dumb agents, dumb individuals, and show how they can evolve this ability to be collaborative, to share intentions. Um, anyway, I'll just emphasize before I move on that this is, uh, this is about the evolution of how people choose what they're going to do. It's not about the actions they do choose when they do it. In that it differs from the evolution of altruism literature. And in some sense, in fact, uh, us sharing intentions, doing things to our mutual benefit, is a mutualistic behavior that uh, doesn't, doesn't, contain any, doesn't contain any altruism. And that's what separates it from the evolution of altruism literature. There's no altruism there. It's mutually beneficial. In a sense, you might think, well, surely that should always evolve. And that's why this hasn't been particularly looked at. People have been interested in, why is there altruism? Why is the spite? Other things, why is the selfishness? Or why is the mutually beneficial interaction? It seems obvious there should be. Although, in fact, there isn't which is good, because if Tomasello's hypothesis were to be true, you would also need a reason for why collaborative forms of interaction didn't evolve, as well as why they did evolve. Because otherwise, you've got the same amount of collaboration amongst all of the great apes, and well, they would be as smart as us. So, onto a model. It's going to be a multi-level selection model along the lines of Similar to um, Sam Bowles' 2006 science paper on the evolution of altruism in a finite setting. But we'll see how networks come into this in a little while. So, there's a big population, there's a meta population, and it's broken up into small subpopulations that we call deeps. And you can think of those as being villages, small villages. And each deep comprises N individuals. Really, you can think of these as being the active individuals in any generation, the actual size of it, including children and grandparents, being larger. And each team, at any given time, is going to have a technology level, tau. And every individual within every team is going to be of two, one of two types. Type SI, which is the type that can share intentions, and type N, which is the type which cannot share intentions. So we're going to look at evolution of those types. And deems can be mixed, or they could be homogenous. There are the two. Here is a quick overview of what happens in the model, most of which is going to be for the purpose of this presentation. You come from some previous generation, and we have three deems, D1, 2, 3. 
Each gene has a technology level, 5, 5, 8 in this case. It has a number of SI types and a number of N types. And then you have a generation. Now within a generation, there's going to be a perturbed adaptive process that gives the fitness of members of the team and also leads to technological advancements within the team. What technological advancement is, is a population's coming to coordinate on better ways of doing things. So you have that process. Some of them, so this CBC, getting to technology level, moves up to six. Following that, in, in, within generational behavior, you have a conflict and extinction phase. What can happen in that phase? So this is, this is the multi-level selection or group selection, old-fashioned way of saying it, kicks in. Each team has a chance of being invaded. So here you see Dean, dean 1, he draws the short straw, has a chance of getting, he, he, he gets invaded. You randomly draw another Dean to invade. Dean 2 invades here. Who wins this battle? The Dean with the higher technology wins the battle. So Dean 2 defeats Dean 1, and then Dean 1 is destroyed and replaced with a replica of Dean 2. So with technology and type replicated. Following the extinction phase, you have reproduction within the Deans, and that's just a, re uh, a replicated dynamic with a finite population, so you can actually get genetic drift there, plus a mutation rate of mu, that happens, and then you move on to the next generation. Fine. So what's going to drive results? Well, what drives results is who's getting, which deems are getting better technology faster, right? Because a deem that gets better technology faster is then going to defeat other deems in the complex and extinction phase. So the question is, and uh, these things are pretty bread and butter. The question is, what, who's going to get better technology faster within this within generation perturbed, perturbed adaptive process? And, and this is where me and my co-author saw we could use work we previously done to to answer this question. And this is where actual networks make a difference. So, I'm going to talk about just this section now. Uh, what happens within a generation? Each generation, each village, you generate a network for each team, looks something like this. Scale-free network, some average degree. This gives an interaction structure. For example, well, you know, it can explain friendships, hunting partners, any of those. Each generation, so you've got an interaction structure in a deep. Each generation has T periods, and at any given time, any individual is either playing old, which is a status quo technology, or new, which is a new incipient budding technology. And at the start of the generation, each individual in the team is playing strategy old. In each period, this game is played with all of the individual's neighbors. So here is the coordination game. If you coordinate an old, you get a payoff of one. If you coordinate on you, you get a payoff of alpha tau. So usually we'll think of alpha as being constant across all the texts to get our results. And this alpha tau is more than one. So you'd rather coordinate on you, all else being equal. The payoff for an individual is then the average of his payoffs from each of these games. So for example, if this guy, so sorry, these are left over from an old presentation. If the red guys are playing you and the black guys are playing old, then this red guy would get a payoff of alpha plus alpha. He's got four edges, so that's two alpha total divided by four, average payoff of alpha over two per interaction. So each period in the generation, some individual or individuals update their strategies, then payoffs are determined, then, if at least, you have to have some condition for when the new technology is adopted. If at least 90% of individuals are playing new, the new technology becomes the status quo, you increase the technology of the team by one, and you reset everyone to play old, and then you keep going. So in this way, the team can increase 
increase its technology level um, within a generation as more and more people switch to playing new until a new technology is adopted. So here's where shared intentions comes into it. Individuals within a team update their strategy in one of two ways, either on their own or in pairs with their neighbors. So anyone can update their, have the opportunity sometimes to update their strategy on their own. Um, only SI types can have the opportunity to do it together. So the strategies can either be updated by individuals or by pairs who are neighboring in the graph, so by two friends who are both SI types. So each period, a single such individual or pair is selected at random, and they play a better response or a coalitional better response. Details available from me whenever you want later today. Um, but essentially, they change their actions in a way that their payoffs, their average payoffs from their interactions, go up. Oh, with some probability, they make a mistake and do the wrong thing as well. So I want to change my action in conjunction with that. We get together, we say, hey, let's play new. We can do better by playing new. That's what we're going to do, unless one of us, with a small probability, makes a mistake. So, how does this lead into results? Now, this, this, these effects come from work we've done in a previous paper. So, how does the ability to share intentions affect the spread of a new efficient, or a new better action on a network? You might think it's a coordination game. If you give people the ability to coordinate their choice of action, that will make it easier for them to get to the efficient thing. Actually, no. That is not always the case. Um, it would always be the case if the network was always the complete network, which is why the interaction structure matters. So in this case, you see you've got two people playing new, these blue ones, two people playing old, these white ones. And if, if there's no pair, if there's no SI, if none of these are SI types, then there's no way that these four individuals here on the network can change their action in a way that benefits themselves. So you see this one here is getting a payoff of I mean, the people at the end of these edges are playing old. This guy here is getting a payoff of alpha. Could he gain by switching to back to old? No, then he get a payoff of one, which is less than alpha. Same with this guy. He's getting a payoff of one, two, three. If he switched to new, he'd get a pair of alpha, which is less than three. However, if there were SI types in there, and if you could have, say, this pair updating their action together, and alpha was less than two, then they could switch together back to playing old and increase their payoff. They'd increase their payoff to two, whereas their payoff was previously one. So in this way, the ability to coordinate your action with your neighbors can help to slow down the uh, spread of good, new, efficient technologies on the network. S similarly, well, this is for low values of alpha. For high values of alpha, there can be a reforming effect, whereas where this ability speeds up the spread of the new technologies on the network. So and this, this all depends on alpha. Small alpha, the ability to make these coalitional moves, these moves with your neighbors, slows down the spread. Large alpha, it speeds up the spread. Just a reminder of what the, what the overall model looked like. So what are we saying is, well, for small alpha, SI types are going to slow down the spread of new technologies. Your team will fall behind the technology. You'll get killed. Uh, that's what that says. This is a picture of how it happens. In this diagram, bluer teams have got lots of S. So each of these dots is a D. And it's simulation of generation 20, 40, and 80. Blue teams, very blue teams, have many SI types. Red teams have mainly have more N types. So you see this, there's a diversity of teams at first. You start them off all, they're all pretty much 50-50. Genetic drift moves them apart from one another. But then the teams, because this is for alpha equals 1.2, a low value of alpha, teams which have, which have very few people who can collaborate get ahead in technology and 
start to kill other teams in um, conflict. They, they, they win conflicts and slowly you see slowly you see the SI types being removed from the population. Well, I say slowly, it's actually pretty fast. It's only 80 generations. For high values of alpha, the opposite happens. Uh, the deems with lots of SI types get ahead and win their battles against the deems with low numbers of SI types. Um, what you end up having is we, we get a phase transition round about here. So this is the SI population fraction for different values of alpha. Alpha, for low values of alpha, SI is selected against. For high values, it's selected for. Um, oh, and you, know, you can see technology advances here. You, see you get faster tech adoptions when alpha is high, which you might expect. Um, okay, and uh, here's Here's um, what tends to happen. It's like if here's, for, here's a high alpha. We just ran this thought as my little do because we've done factorial experiments for a while, and I thought a lot of this, so um, it's easy to do a lot of high alpha. Here's what happens: we're starting populations off with no SI types whatsoever. You see, group, small amounts of SI emerge, and then boom, it takes over. It's not quite as neat. So this is for high alpha SI taking over. It's not quite as neat for low alpha. Um, so this is for low alpha. You see, we start off with about approximately half of everyone being SI, and then this this drops down. But you see, for some of the runs, each of these is a replicate. For some of over two thousand generations, for some of the runs, there's these occasional breakouts of SI behavior. The reason for that is on the individual selection level, SI is selected for. I told you what the group selection did, and it depends on alpha. On the individual level, SI is selected for. So occasionally, little <laughs> clusters of SI, once everyone's roughly the same technology, a bit of SI can infect a relatively successful team, take it over, and then you can have SI having a little outbreak in the population for a while. Okay, so uh, what can I say about this in the remaining 30 seconds? Uh, though, there's a lot of questions you can ask about the novel, but still, not the novel, uh, but model. Uh, but there's, there's probably not been enough time to most of them to form in your head. Uh, <laughs> so, just in essence, and um, I'll leave these for any questions on them. In essence, what we've done is we've we've given a model that shows how the ability to share intentions collaborate in action choice can either evolve or not evolve depending on conditions in populations. And so we've done it with groups of group selection model. Uh, that's not too bad though because it's not as if a single SI type, that guy, can get into a population of, of non-SI people and start to outperform them on an individual level because the actual SI ability only is going to help you if there are other people around. So your type in this sense, it's model of rule evolution, and your, your type affects your behavioral rule, but only when you have other people present who are also of that type. Um, yeah, that's all I can give you for now. So uh, thank you. And Thank you. 
could always say maybe alpha was always low, and then you just by some luck got one of these bursts, and then at the same time, simultaneously, some cultural institutions emerge, for instance, food sharing and things that tend to be issued in modern culturism, um, which actually presuppose the kind of collaboration you talk about. Um, and yeah, you perhaps caught one of these waves and surfed it into the future of humanity. <laughs> So this, this is built on a coordination game. Um, so the reason is so, I mean, at least in the anthropology literature, there's some evidence that at least some, in hunter-gatherer society, some evidence that some behavior is mutualistic. And it might, might make sense for both of us to go out hunting together because we can, we can target larger prey, for example. Um, and that's, that's why we focus on these type of behaviors. We didn't want the story to get modeled with, with questions of self-enforceability of our decisions to do things together. Because here, when we say, hey, let's do something, let's change our actions together, uh, there doesn't arise a subsequent question of whether I can trust you or not, because it's in both of our interests. Questions of self-enforceability are interesting, but I think they probably come after, for example, after questions of whether we can cooperate or not. The analogy I like is the question is, is communication in the sense of I need to be able to communicate something to you for the idea of a lie to even make to even make any sense. So in some sense we need to be able to coordinate our plans in some way for the idea of me to lie about coordinating the plans that I think we're going to do to to even make sense. Um, there's of course been a lot on prisoners dilemmas. Another thing here is that I, the, the interesting thing is that it doesn't evolve sometimes. You've got the non-evolution of this mutualistic behavior, which is the behavior that on pairwise or in small groups, it benefits us all, but it damages for low alpha, it damages, it slows down technology adoption on in, in a D for, for, for the group as a whole. Um, Whereas it's it's fairly easy in prison dilemmas to see how individualistic behaviour, even never mind small group behaviour, can can damage out, well, outcomes for a group as a whole. But here, it's, it's even even those basic even though those basic interactions are mutualistic, it still in some cases could damage the group as a whole. Not at all. So, yeah. Thank you.